Thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Uh, I want to talk uh, about the future of climate activism uh, because we are all activists now in terms of the political and social change we have to engender. Uh, we have a big green mountain to climb. I'm loving the stage setting here. Uh, and there's a refreshing, invigorating waterfall uh, of ideas coming through uh, these two days. So we need that because we're in a bad position. Owing to past neglect, in the face of the plainest warnings, we have entered upon a period of danger. The era of procrastination, of half measures, of soothing and baffling expedience of delays is coming to its close. In its place, we are entering a period of consequences. We cannot avoid that period. We are in it now. Now, Churchill was obviously talking about the Second World War, uh, but we are now facing a similar kind of challenge. And there is a number of conflicts kicking off around the world uh, as we see the world heat up, both literally and metaphorically. What Ukraine, in particular, has taught us uh, is our interdependence and our interconnectedness. Those energy and food crises which are unfolding as a result of the conflict there remind us how closely linked we are. And it can feel a bit apocalyptic when you look at what's going on in the world. But I don't mean apocalypse in terms of Armageddon. I mean the true root of the word, which is the uncovering, the drawing back of the veil, the revelation to see the world as it actually is. Uh, as Chipran said, I'm uh, a futurist. Uh, my job is not to predict and analyze existing trends, but to stretch the imagination of the possible. And in order to do that, you have to listen to the real questions the future is asking you. Now, I speak at a lot of events, not all of them as glorious uh, as this particular setting here in the Opera House. Uh, this is me speaking at a lawnmower conference because, hey, I get all the glamour gigs. Um, this, ladies and gentlemen, is a 125 mile an hour lawnmower. I don't know what question they think the future is asking them, but I'm pretty sure it's not, where is my 125 mile an hour lawnmower? Um, as the introduction said, I do a podcast with a, a British comedian and another futurist, and in that podcast we ask three questions. How effed are we? Why are we effed? And how do we un -eff ourselves? Uh, that's going to be the structure for the rest of this talk. So, how effed are we? Um, it's worth just revisiting um, how F we are, because I've been working in climate change for 25 years. When I first started, it was kind of hard denial. So people saying climate change isn't real, to okay, it's us, but is it really like, you know, as bad as everyone says, to this moment of brutal reality and realization. Um, I don't need to re-emphasize the science to you, but basically where we are right now in September, October 2023, we're off the charts in terms of temperature distributions. Um, even The Economist, that left-wing, anarchic, radical publication, has said we can kiss goodbye to 1.5 degrees. The question the future is asking us is how hot are we going to allow it to get? Because it's only going to keep rising. We've added 1.5 degrees pretty much already. Uh, you know, we're heading towards two or three degrees. And that matters. Because if you look at where our policies and actions currently take us, the blue band on that graph, it's a two and a half to three degree world. Whereas where we need to be is 1.5 degrees. So there is a 20 gigaton carbon ambition gap by the end of this decade. That's roughly a 50% cut in our current emissions. And we all know the consequences of not addressing this because as the world heats up, the weather becomes more violent. Also, as the world heats up, we become more violent. So this is going to affect us both in terms of our meteorology with a more turbulent climate, but also with a more turbulent population. Uh, and we've already seen some of the catastrophic effects. I mean, this was the floods in Libya just a few weeks ago, uh, which killed somewhere between four and 10,000 people. The insurance industry grasps all of this. The insurance industry knows that we're heading towards an uninsurable world because of the increased, uh, um, the increased severity and frequency uh, of these big climatic events. So in this respect, climate change is a threat multiplier. 
It makes all of our other challenges much, much harder to deal with and is arguably the greatest risk management failure in history. If you look at what internal auditors say now, they say climate should be presented as a principle and forever risk. Which is why events like this are so important because as Antonio Guterres from the United Nations, the Secretary General said, basically we need to massively fast track climate efforts by every country and every sector and on every time frame. What we need is everything, everywhere, all at once. I don't know if you feel like you're doing everything, everywhere, all at once right now, but that's the challenge we need to step into. And it's also not just carbon and climate, it is also the nature crisis. If you understand and have watched the movie The Big Short about the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, you will know that what brought the financial system crashing down was a lack of capital underpinning the exchanges, the collateralized debt obligations and the credit default swaps. If you like, what we're doing right now is a big short of ecology without the required natural capital underpinning it. And that's important because half of the world's GDP is still dependent on nature. And Earth Overshoot Day, which is the day of the year where we move beyond the natural biological carrying capacity of the planet, occurs on July 28th. So then we're in debt. And that's important because this is not a mass extinction event, it's an extermination event because we know exactly what we are doing to the web of life. Plus, you know, the way we've developed so far by burning stuff um, is killing us. The World Health Organization says about uh, one in eight people uh, uh, are killed by some form of air pollution. Plus, the overheating of the planet is going to mobilize somewhere around 1.2 billion refugees by the middle of the century. As David Blower of the Sierra Club in the United States said, there is no business to be done on a dead planet. So this, if you like, is a moment of reckoning where we have to look up our own fundament to see that we should be doing things radically differently. So why are we in this mess? Well, partly it's because we're great at posturing. We're great at trying to look like we're doing the right thing, but not doing the things that actually really make a difference. Um, Hans shared a similar version of this slide this morning, where we talk about all of these exponential effects the things which have really taken off in terms of impacts. Now, Johan Rockstrom from the Stockholm Resilience Center, who talks about uh, this great acceleration, said this is the ecosystem, this is the environment starting to send back invoices to the economy, calling back in that ecological debt, the, the natural capital we've destroyed. And Hans also showed this image which I think is worth reminding ourselves about because it shows that this is not just about population, it is absolutely about consumption in certain parts of the world. And that is tending to be the developed world where the richest 10% of people on the planet are responsible for about half of those lifestyle emissions. As they say in Fight Club, we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like who largely don't care. And that, if you like, is the, the treadmill of material consumption that we are stuck on. So we have to be cautious about this overconsumption bomb because there is simply no way on earth, literally, that the whole world can live in the inefficient and profligate way that we do right now. And that overconsumption bomb is similar to the carbon bombs, which are these new fossil fuel reserves which would also tip us over into climate catastrophe. And there are a number of these new fossil fuel fields which nations around the world are trying to bring online. The International Energy Agency has been clear. We do not need new oil and gas fields to come online on the existing net zero pathway. And that's the IEA that used to be the defenders of fossil fuels. So we know that they knew these big players, the big fossil fuel, the big oil and gas giants, have known about this since the 70s. So one of the reasons that we're in so much trouble right now is despite the fact they knew, we have essentially unleashed hell on Earth. And as Upton Sinclair, uh, the former US presidential candidate said, it's difficult to get a man or a woman to understand something when their salary depends on them not understanding it. 
Uh, and this is where we are. So I, my challenge to all of us is that we're currently experiencing a lot of willful blindness. Which, and willful blindness is a legal principle that you are responsible if you could have known, and indeed should have known, something instead which you chose, or even actively strove not to see. And you're still legally liable uh, in that position. As my colleague at the Forward Institute, Margaret Heffernan, says, the truth won't set us free until we develop the skills, the habit, the talents, but perhaps most importantly, the moral courage to use it. So, as I said, we're looking up our own fundament. We have to stare in the mirror. Are we going to see narcissus uh, and self-love or have a bit of catharsis to what we really need to do next? Um, as this cartoon uh, in, from Tom Toro in The New Yorker has it, yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. So the honesty gap needs to be closed, and also we need to challenge the system because the system isn't broken, as my friend uh, Kate Simpson from Wasafiri says, it's working for someone. And so in order to change the system, you also have to target who it is working for. So how do we unf ourselves? How do we bring this around to a positive, upbeat challenge to ourselves? Uh, well, I live in the country now after 25 years in London. If you get lost in the country and you ask a farmer for directions, you can guarantee the response you will get is, well, if I were you, I wouldn't start from here. Uh, unfortunately, we are where we are. You know, it's not the best position to be in. We've made some progress, but nowhere near enough. One of the most powerful things we do is we break the amerta, the mafia code of silence. We talk about climate and we bring climate front and center to all our strategic discussions. Not at the end of the discussion, at the beginning. What is it we are going to do and what is our effects on climate and nature? And I want to take you through the five areas very quickly that I think activism has to engage with. And one is challenging power. Challenging incumbent power, like the fossil fuel businesses, like the big corporate interests, because the race to net zero is on. We're all agreed about where we're going, it's how fast we get there. What is happening in the UK right now is that power is being challenged in the courts through prosecution. Client Earth um, has challenged the UK government because we now have, as well as a net zero by 2050 target, we have a 78% reduction due by 2035. That is sharpening minds. Client Earth sued the government, saying that their climate strategy was unlawful because it was not delivering that net zero legal obligation. Um, and the government didn't even appeal when they lost. They kind of accepted that that wasn't the case. And equally, we are now seeing directors of large businesses also being taken to court for failing in their fiduciary duty. There are 2,000 climate lawsuits live globally right now. It's getting legal. It's getting serious. We also need to change the politics. The politics is difficult. You know, we are seeing uh, a kind of increasing interest. We in the UK, we have the Green Party and the Climate Party. Uh, we also have the mainstream parties helping to declare climate and uh, an ecological emergency. But our challenges are also being politicized. And this is another area of contention. Ultra low emission zones, you know, the, the zones that have been brought in in London and in other cities to try and improve air quality uh, as well as tackle climate change uh, are now being met with a lot of resistance. And let's be clear, this is our children's lungs. This is Ella Kissy Debra, who was nine who died because of chronic asthma and various respiratory conditions because of where she lived next to one of the main roads in London. Now, there's 250,000 kids that suffer from asthma in London alone. So this needs to change. So we need to bring the power in. We need to challenge the politics. Uh, and we need to bring in the people. And the most powerful way we have at our disposal right now to bring the people into the discussion is through citizens' assemblies. These democratic, representative, sortition-based deliberative forums. And they matter because this is the way we can generate radical policy. The critical thing being, those citizens' assembly must have a political mandate, and the outcomes from those assemblies must be taken seriously, potentially through legal obligation on the politicians involved. And why assemblies are important is because they represent the common interest, they are a deliberative process, 
So we spend time talking through the complexity of the challenges. It's not a glib, social media-based, hot-headed uh, conversation. It, it is representative and inclusive because they are demographically selected from a cross-section of the wider population. They are very efficient uh, in terms of working through some very difficult policy challenges, and they are legitimate. And what we find is through citizens' assemblies, the people are far more radical than the politicians ever give them credit for, because we can actually get to those higher aspirations and those bigger changes. And then we need the persuasion. So we've got the power, the politics, bringing the people in, and then the powers of persuasion. One of the more powerful campaigns in the UK is called The Jump, uh, which is based around less stuff, more joy, uh, and essentially six core behaviors to encourage people to take, which genuinely make a difference in terms of personal lifestyles. And these are about keeping your products for a bit longer, maybe not seven years, but certainly not the annual upgrade. It makes a big difference. Traveling fresh, so walking or cycling and, and giving up your car, if at all possible. Um, eating plant-based. Now, you don't have to go vegan, but modifying the amount of meat and dairy in your diet can have a massive impact. This is the one that some people find challenging. Three new items of clothing a year. But upcycle, buy second hand, buy vintage, swap clothes with each other, and it becomes more fun. One thing that I'm very passionate about, because I essentially gave up flying on holiday nearly 20 years ago, is one flight every three years, and then one big shift to help push the system, change your bank account, uh, you know, change your mortgage, challenge your pension fund, get involved in those other systemic shifts. The good news is those behaviors, if they were undertaken by everyone in the population, they make up 25% of the emissions reductions we need by 2030. So this is very powerful if we can persuade people to do it. And finally, the fifth P, if you like, is protest. We absolutely have to keep the protest movement going because since 2018, since the arrival of Extinction Rebellion and Greta Thunberg, we have seen a transformation of the landscape, uh, Fridays for Future, uh, and these voices coming to the fore, which absolutely, as I can say this with someone who's had 25 years experience in this field, was a game changer for all the conversations I had with government and business. So. To wind it up, you know, we're not stuck in traffic. We are traffic. You know, we are all activists now. We all have to do everything in our power and in our influence to make change happen. The journey we are on is from a degenerative, an absolutely degenerative economy. And sustainability is only a stepping stone on this journey. Where we have to be is regenerative, where we are able to start building back that natural capital that we have depleted so quickly. And in a way, to translate this, basically any investment now that doesn't put human health and the environment at the heart of it is not an investment. It's a cost on the future because we're going to have to pay that cost back. If you build a house now which is not net zero fit, you are going to have to retrofit it. So we need to get this right. And if, if we don't get it right, it's actually not just a cost on the future, it's a theft from the future. As Darth Vader might have said in Star Wars, the construction of our new Death Star is an amazing job creation opportunity. I mean, yeah, it is, but it destroys planets. So right now we're faced with breakdown and Basically, business or change as usual is not going to get us past this. We need breakthrough. And that's where these five Ps, power, politics, people, persuasion, and protest might potentially unlock what we have in front of us. If I go back to what I said at the beginning, the wise learn from the past and draw wisdom from their historical experience. That is not going to be enough for what we need to do next. We have to really be brave and courageously listen to the real questions the future is asking us. That leads to a shakedown, and there are organizations which will have that courage, which will step in to trailblaze and pioneer the future we need, and there will be organizations which are conducting a rearguard action, which are slowing the pace of the change in favor of their own self-interest. Which side of that discussion do you want to be on? Because there's much talk about saving the planet, 
I don't think it's about saving the planet. The planet doesn't need to be rescued or changed. The planet just needs to be loved and appreciated for all the bountiful beauty and gifts that it bestows upon us. So this is manifestly about our own collective human potential to manage ourselves better as we head into the middle of the 21st century. It is about our children's future. My daughter is six. She will still be here in 2100, most likely. Uh, so the decisions we make today will absolutely define the type of world that she will live in. And it is about our stability and freedom. We may miss the Paris Agreement targets of 1.5, but every tenth of a degree of climate change matters, and every ton of carbon that doesn't go into the atmosphere now matters, because it alleviates future human suffering in some way, shape, or form. So let's climb that big green hill together. Let's enjoy the refreshing invigoration of this waterfall of ideas, because right now, only the impossible is interesting. Thank you.